Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am here with Martin Scooby-Doo Willis. Scooby-Doo! I you know how he talks. No. Yeah, kind of like they, that. You know, he goes, roar, 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 like a dog. Roar, roar for me. Yeah. yeah. You know why I called like you that. Scooby-Doo Willis? Uh, I guess I'll find out. I never know what you're going to call me. The uh-huh. listeners should know that. I so. have no idea, actually, this time. <laughs> I was asking you, <laughs> hoping that you would know it. Just it just popped out. I have no clue. Maybe because you're shaggy ish in a way, but uh also oh, friendly whoa. like a pet, like a like like a Scooby Doo. So for some reason I just it just came out. How strange is wow. that? Kinda like word association game or something. Or Tourette's. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. So maybe if somebody, one of the listeners is a is a psychologist or maybe you're in in school taking a class on word association or something, you can let us know why I might have called you Scooby-Doo Willis. But it's kind of cool. Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Scooby-Doo's like cool, well, yeah, man. We could be their ink blot, so yep. to speak. Yep, yep. yep. So right. uh, we'll talk about the guest. So the guest is really cool. It's really exciting. Someone I haven't had before. His name is Richard Beckwith, and he's a lawyer. He's actually a city lawyer for Rock Springs, Wyoming. He's also the Mutual UFO Network's Wyoming state director and has been for a long time. And he is uh, more recently on the business board of MUFON. So a really interesting fellow. He helped put together the Hewlett Wyoming, the the UFO rendezvous thing that I spoke at a couple weeks ago. Um, Mm -hmm. And he uh, he he kind of yeah they got a hold of him when they put that together. So he helped put the get the speakers. Um. So, yeah, he's a really interesting fellow. I've met him before, but this was the first time I got to spend time with him, and it was really nice. Um, You know, he made a point to say at the end of the conference that Wyoming's known for having very nice people. You know, that's a a big deal for them in Wyoming, I guess, to to be nice. And they they are. We experienced that. Everybody in Wyoming was really cool. So, um, wow, yeah, it's really interesting uh, to have his perspective. that, That means a lot. To me, when I'm traveling, how the atmosphere and the you know you're treated mm-hmm. by the public, and as you know, I went to Shag Harbor for the fiftieth. Oh, class. that's right. How did that yeah. go? Um, well, let me tell you, the people there were the friendliest people. I stopped over actually in Fredericton, where um, mm-hmm. Stan Friedman lives, and I understand why he lives there. It was actually beautiful. Really? Yep. And everyone is so friendly. It was, uh, and it's funny when I talked to someone, they said, "Well, we always think people in Maine are friendly." Hmm. <laughs> But that's a long, long drive. Really? Uh, so, and yeah, you just got I back, can, right? Uh, yeah, just got back. Yeah, like it's. Uh, I did thirty some odd hours of driving total. Holy way, moly! Way too long. Never. I'll. I'll never do that again. I don't want to drive. You know, I used to drive to Roswell, and it was like took twelve hours because I would stop at the. I had to stop at the couple of missile museums at White Sands every time, and it is gorgeous, and I love White Sands. But I just can't do it anymore. I don't know that I would uh, ever do that again. Wow. You know, I I plan on driving to Phoenix for the UFO Congress this year. So mm-hmm. I want to take so I want to take a lot wow. of time and make it more of a vacation than just you know a straight drive. It's straight drives are just hmm. too much. Yeah, they are a lot. Now, have you been through the White Sands area, New Mexico, I have and stuff? Not. Oh, no. so maybe you should do that. Uh, because then you can also see like the 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 satellite array, the very large array, you know, where they do the oh. SETI stuff. Uh, the really? missile wow. si- sites are really cool. Nellis Air Force Base is there, and uh, a lot of space history, and uh, really, really cool stuff. Gorgeous. Wow, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Now, is that 
that's further away. No, that's before I would get to you if I took a different oh, route. Oh, yeah, that's before. You'd have to go down south and then cut over. Yeah. Might be well, fun. I don't know. something to think about. Yeah, yeah. The weather would be better You could because you, once you head out south into the desert, you know, you won't have to worry about any weather. Mm-hmm. True, true, So it's true. worth thinking about, buddy. We'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, good thing. So right. let's go ahead and get on to news. What's the news, buddy? Well, I just, this uh, title just caught my eye. Mm. I, I love the title. Mm-hmm. It's Mysterious Red Blob mm. Photographed in the Louisiana Night Sky. Mm-hmm. So right away, I think of the movie, The Blob. Mm-hmm. There was actually two of them, but the first one was with Stephen McQueen back in 1950s where the blob was alien life trying to take over the world. Was this it? No, I don't well, think so. I hope not. Well, maybe not. Well, um, this was near Bow Bridge, Louisiana, and it was an odd, like, blob. Um, it's right on your website. It's really an amazing photo. It does look like something, you know, astronomical, some type of thing happening, and it very well could be very far away, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, here is a direct quote uh, from the witness who took a bunch of pictures on the night of Wednesday, September 13th, about 10 p.m. My wife and I were about to leave our house in Bow Bridge, Louisiana. Before getting in the truck, I looked up into the sky and noticed a faint blob directly above. I said to my wife, what the heck is that? She looked up and saw it as well. And they stared for it for about 10 minutes. And then before he even thought about taking a picture, and so he used a couple of different types of uh, cameras on it and different uh, lenses. And so it's a great picture, but all of a sudden this thing just plain, it didn't fade out. It just disappeared. Mm-hmm. And so he went and he looked at the website called heavensabove.com um, where you can find out about anything going on in the sky. There was a part of a Russian rock rocket like space junk. That circled over about the same time, but that would be more like a point of light reflected from the sun, not like a red blob. So, and this this uh, witness, I believe, is a uh, possibly a listener to the show and read your website. So, yeah, uh, how did you how did you get the story? Did he contact you directly? Yeah, he did. It was a private message on Facebook, and he said, you know, like people do, I have some interesting pictures, and I never get too excited because. Right. Unfortunately, and I do look at the pictures, you know, I I like to at least take a look and, you know, it's usually birds, bugs, satellites, planets, almost, you know, 90%, 95% of the time. But he, I said, sure, I'll take a look. He shared the photos and I was like, I don't know what the heck that is. And I looked at heavens above. There was a rocket in the area earlier in the hour, about 20 after the hour. And he saw this, you know, closer to... Um, 10 p.m. And so, uh, plus it didn't, it doesn't look like a rocket. A rocket, like you said, is going to look like a satellite moving, you know, space junk, which is what that rocket that Heavens Above said was there about 20 after the hour. It'll look like a point of light moving steadily across the sky. And this did not look like that. It looks like an orange blob. Someone made a comment, um, Angelo Dongas, who's one of the moderators in our Open Mind UFO News group, he's great. We have a lot of great people. Who, on Facebook. Uh-huh. Yeah, on Facebook, who are good at identifying things. And I posted it on there, and I kind of said, okay, guys, what do you think? And uh, nobody's quite sure. He said it looks like maybe a dust trail from a meteor that's illuminated by the sun. That's not a bad idea, although it is red. Um, right. I haven't seen kind of one. orangey. Mm. Yeah, reddish orangish. So it could be, you know, uh, maybe something. Yeah, I don't know. So we did ask Mark D'Antonio. He said he would get back, uh, but he hasn't yet. So he might How be about, still uh, trying to figure it out. Yeah, pardon me. How about uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bennett, the astrophysicist? Uh, I don't think it's him because he wouldn't. Uh, I don't think he, we would be able to see him in space if he was floating in, in space. <laughs> well, it was just a thought. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think it's Jeffrey Bennett. Um, uh, and, and his complexion was more, he's a more fair-skinned fellow. 
Yeah, he's not really that. He is not the Trump orange. No, right. Should I get be. a hold of him? He, I think he's a bit hard to get a hold of, but I could try. And that's not a bad thought is to try to get a hold of other astronomers because uh, Jeffrey Bennett, you know, even though he spoke at our conference, really interesting fellow. In fact, you can go see him on our video on demand and you can try for seven weeks, get a free trial of the UFO Congress video on demand so you can watch Jeffrey Bennett there. Really fascinating talk. Great guy. Um, but he yeah. does a lot of big stuff. Like he works with NASA and, and he, he writes books, uh, college, you know, books and stuff. So he's children's he's, books too. Yeah. So he's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And uh, they even mm-hmm. like read those children's books uh, from the ISS. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah this is guy. an interesting one. This one's really weird. At first glance, Mark couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, so we'll have to see it. It's it's really cool. If it is a rocket launch, um, it's not one that's on the books. So, and it's, um, it doesn't appear to be like the other ones that I've seen. Yeah. I mean, just because of the color alone. I mean, the color is really odd. Yeah. It's a cool one, though. It's pretty neat. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh this alien autopsy stuff oh yeah has blown up and i think we talked about it maybe even a week ago cuz that's how it started so um so here's what happened if you remember so spiros malaris he's a guy who works on films he does art and um you know works in special effects and stuff he uh philip mantle who's a uk researcher and he he is a contributor for openminds.tv he's already written about this but Malaris hasn't really come forward to mainstream media to to confess to them that he was the one who helped arrange and fake this alien autopsy footage uh, that is so famous that is out there. Well, he spoke to uh, one of the newspapers, and I I think it's the Daily Express. I should um, double check that. But he spoke with... um, one of the newspapers, and he confessed. And I guess he's doing some sort of show in London or something like that. And, uh, oh, it's a Metro News who he spoke to. So he confessed and said, you know, we created this, uh, that the Santilli and this other guy had come to him, uh, Gary Shufield, and wanted the, him to create an alien autopsy thing. So they did, and they thought it was fun and kind of a joke and stuff like that, how mm-hmm. he really looked for 1940s material, how the two people in the video are his girlfriend and his brother are in the outfits, you know, doing these operations, <laughs> how they got guts out of lambs and cows from the nearest uh, butcher shop to create the the guts and stuff in there oh, and how God. there is this guy John, John Humphreys who created the actual body the actual skin of the thing and Humphreys is another sci-fi guy works in lots of sci-fi so and all of this we for the, we knew a lot of this from Philip Mantle's work but you know this was the first real big mainstream story so that went big well the Daily Express then heard from Santilli, Ray Santilli, and he's a guy who made a bunch of money and kept pushing right. this is real. And mm-hmm. Santilli says, now there was this movie these two comedians made about the film where they played like this these hoaxers. And uh, it was a movie in the UK. You can, you, I think it's on Netflix. You can watch it. But oh, yeah. there's some mm-hmm. footage at the end that they get in the movie where... That is, you know, they said that they saw some real footage, just like Santilli says. They couldn't get their hands on it or it was too poor. So they recreated what they saw and then they sold that as real. They got bu- busted because it was a hoax, but they maintained that, you know what, but really we saw real film. Where in the movie version, at the end, this mysterious courier comes and gives them a video and it's the real video. But by now, they're exposed as hoaxers, so they can't do anything with it because no one will believe them. Well, Santilli and others tried to make that this video, this footage in the film was real. Mm. That was part of this movie with this com- these comedians. So they've huh. been trying to say that. However, Humphreys and others have said, no, we created that. That is not real either. That's fake. We made it for the movie because John Humphreys, who... Uh, was part of hoaxing the original stuff, was also 
uh, commissioned to work on this movie with the comedians to create uh, the stuff for, for this movie. Well, Santilli comes to the Daily Express and says, hey, that's not true. There really was real footage. And in fact, I've never provided any of the real footage to anyone. But here, Daily Express, here is a piece of the film from the real stuff. Well, a lot of people notice that it looks like the hoax stuff. And actually, this guy, Scott Brando, who runs this site, uh, UFO of Interest, sent uh, tweeted me. And he said, look, all he did was take a still from the fake, the fake video, put it in negative, and then messed with it. And oh, he, he proved it because he took a still from the video and he puts the Santilli new Santilli image next to it and sure enough it's exactly the same so and I put that up on the website so yeah Santilli's off hoaxing and and again so I wrote a story about this um, about all of this Mantle's Mm. work and then what Scott Brando had found well the Daily Express saw it which isn't too surprising. They cover a lot of our stories. And they wrote about what uh, Scott Brando and, and Mantle had discovered from my story. But they also talked to their own expert. Their own expert said, yeah, this is just a still from the hoax video manipulated with Photoshop. And so they tried to call Santilli and say, hey, what's going on? You provided us with a hoaxed image. They emailed him and told him, hey, you know, everybody's saying that this is just a hoax image from the, or uh, from the hoax footage. And he, his response was 1947. That's all he wrote. <laughs> so then they tried well, to call him and he said, I'm driving and hung up and they haven't heard from him. So Santilli's busted again. I don't know. There's still a lot of people who want to believe so badly. But this yes. Santilli guy obviously is a trickster and a liar. Well, you know, a couple of things. Um, come to mind. First of all, he he's he must be fairly intelligent, and you would think mm-hmm. that he would go to some edited part, unedited part of the film as they were shooting that didn't they couldn't cross reference. Yeah, um, to, I know. You, you know, and then he would take a still from there and you know manipulate it. Um, I mean, if I was going to <laughs> hoax something, yeah. I would try to think it out a little bit. You know, but, yeah. but still. Another thing is, or a question is, uh, did he ever get sued by anyone? Well, who would sue him? Uh, You know, someone that, was this all uh, profits from uh, the money that he made on this? Do you know what the profits were generated from? The profits were generated from a television show, which was huge, um, and made him like millions of dollars. This television show was produced by Bob Kiviat, who, incidentally, I just got off the phone with not too long ago about something else. He does a lot of UFO television shows, um, and and he's really interested in the UFO phenomena. In fact, he later released another documentary about hoaxes, and he included how you know they were tricked how this was a hoax um this this documentary he was a part of prior but that documentary and then and uh, got you really huge it was jonathan frakes uh from star trek was the narrator um so that's where it all started and that's where they made a, a lot of money from it and uh, everybody else involved has kind of said okay it, it wasn't real but um he's the only one still holding out um, yeah. That, well, he's uh, got everything to lose by it. And another yeah. thing, um, also, this is probably a known fact by you, but maybe not to some of the listeners, that um, when you look at the alien autopsy film, you see the leg badly uh, injured and fragmented. I think it's like the uh, right leg or something of the alien. And that actually was done by accident. They they damaged the model, and then they try to make it look like it was an injury. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's uh, funny. I didn't know Phil that Phil Mantle story. told me that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to post another follow-up from Philip Mantle. So hopefully this will end it because I know we don't want to, you know, keep 
on this story for too long. But uh, yeah, Philip did want to have his say, and I think that that's fair. So he did write me something yeah. that I'm going to post today. But uh, yeah, funny stuff. Another thing, too, I wanted to mention um, this week, a couple interesting stories that we have up there. I did post a story up about, about Prince Philip. So we talked about how the Sun had covered some of another UK tabloid, but they covered a, a good writer with them was at the Wyoming event and had covered um, some of my talk, in particular about Lord Montbatten, who is Prince Philip's uncle, Prince Philip's being the husband of the Queen. And um, But I, I noticed that I had written a story for Huffington Post that I didn't put on Open Minds, which was about Phil, Prince Philip's UFO interests and some stuff about him, so I have that up. But this is kind of interesting. I think you'll find this interesting. A couple of stories that have popped up today – one of them that I think is really cool is behind these these mummy hoaxes. So here again we have, oh, wow. in this case, Gaia and Jaime Masson out there trying mm-hmm. to say that these mummies are real uh, aliens when they're not. You know, we keep getting this from the they're all from the same area, these deserts in Chile and Peru, uh, where the bodies are are preserved for a long time because there's the, these very dry deserts. So it keeps happening over and over, and finally The Atlantic wrote a story about people in the area being really upset that Americans keep taking these mummies and calling them aliens. Wow. So mm-hmm. this story in The Atlantic is called The Racism Behind Alien Mummy Hoaxes. Wow. Really interesting and good stuff. And I'm so glad they did that, actually. I know, me too. Yeah, um, they ought to hire uh, Santilli to help them You know, keep <laughs> yeah. pushing this. Yeah, exactly. So the other one story that came out is The Guardian. So I felt like, you know, the UFO field had dodged a bullet in that when the whole Roswell slides thing took place, uh, which you have I you and I have covered exhaustively, Mm -hmm. um, the major media didn't seem to take notice. Well, unfortunately, after all of these years, The Guardian, one of, if not the most respected newspaper in the UK, wrote a story about it. It's called The Curious Case of the Alien in the Photo and the Mystery That Took Years to Solve. They're nice about it, as nice as you can be, but they do, for the most part, cover honestly and accurately the events and how, even though... These guys had worked for years on this mummy, how once they released the full image, or it leaked technically, um, that uh, within the matter of a day or two, people discovered what the placard had said with this this mummy and, and found it to be just that, a mummy instead of an alien. So it... it reads kind of like the story, a UFO story, I think like the mainstream would predict that you know some people found these images they thought looked weird uh people jumped on this alien theory and alien ufo researchers tried to prove that it was alien and very quickly uh once it made it to the public it was debunked um thoroughly so yeah right i never i still scratch my head thinking about how that ever got as far as it did Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know uh, and especially with you know the people involved, you know, know that are that uh, feel burned from it, you know. Yeah, and that's a controversy. They've kind of got the people who originally had the pictures versus you know Don Schmidt and Tom Carey because Don Schmidt and Tom Carey admit you know we were fooled, we were we wanted to right. believe too badly, we overlook things we shouldn't have. So they they are humble and they admit they really screwed up in this story. But at the same time, they're blaming the people who found the photos of of trying to trick them. And I don't yes. think the evidence is there that they were trying to be tricked. Honestly, I personally spoke with Adam Dew, the guy who is representing the people. Uh, who who found the photos, and he's in this story, of course, and he's pretty nice about it. He's like, hey, you know, I didn't know what it was. I tried to stay unbiased on this, but, you know, the, the researchers wanted to believe so badly. And that's kind of the sentiment I got from interviewing him. I didn't find him to be uh, a deceptive person. I think he was just curious and really trying to find out what was going on. It's funny, I... I you know, I'm in the fine arts and auction business. There was a story about all these antique and fine art dealers at an auction, and they're all looking at this painting, and they're looking at the signature, and they said, 
they admitted that they were all trying to make it say the name of a famous artist. Oh, you know, and in it their wasn't. Heads. Yeah, and it wasn't. Yeah, yep. that's and, a problem. Like, uh, like yeah. the Mulder poster says, you know, I want to believe. There are so many people who do want to believe, and we have to self-check ourselves. And that's why, you know, right. it, it's good to be skeptical and cynical because, of course, you know, you've got to check yourself against your your desire to believe or to prove that something's going on. So true. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. So thank you, Martin, uh, Scooby-Doo Willis, for joining us for the news. Right. <laughs> I forgot how Scooby-Doo talked, but something like that. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. That was pretty good. That was Scooby-Doo-ish. Yep. Good job there. Well, thank you very much. And, of course, people can hear Martin Willis at Podcast UFO. For now, let's go ahead and take a quick break. And we'll be right back with Richard Beckwith. I'm very happy to welcome to the show for the first time Richard Beckwith. Hello. Hello, Alejandra. How are you today? Good. And and would it be accurate? I mean, are all lawyers esquires? I'm not familiar <laughs> exactly with what the term refers I think to. That's, a, that's sort of an outdated term, I think. <laughs> you know, if I want to give one of my fellow lawyers a, a ration of stuff, I will uh, call him esquire. Or her. <laughs> so it's sort of an outdated term. It's a fun so, term, though. It reminds me of like the Victorian era or something. Yeah, it sort of adds a, a, a level of, uh, I guess, regalness uh, to your persona without actually doing anything for you. It's just Esquire. It, uh, it's, uh, but if you guys use it to make fun of each other, I guess I'll, I'll refrain from using it. <laughs> That's okay. Well, it's good to talk to you. So we've met before, but uh, we we are now, I like to say, friends because we spent yep. what wasn't a long time, but it felt like a long time. It felt like it was a very intimate setting in, in Wyoming uh, this couple weekends ago, and we all got to know each other so well. And I'm so happy I got to meet you and spend more time with you. Yeah, I, I am too, Alejandro. I'm glad we got to know each other a bit. I think we actually... Uh met the first time at the 2009 MUFON Symposium in Denver, and uh, and I've seen you a couple of times since then, but we haven't really had a, a lot of opportunity to, to get together and talk like we did at the Devil's Tower event. And, and of course, uh, we have mutual friends, uh, Stanislav Ojak and, and so forth, and, uh, and uh, you also uh, uh, knew uh, Debbie and Chuck. And I see that they've been getting uh, quite a bit of press lately with their 37th parallel uh, book that they've been uh, talking about mm -hmm. on the internet. And I, I know they talked about it a little bit at uh, the Devil's Tower event. Yeah, cool stuff. So yeah. um, I guess to start off, uh, with the first question I would have, I think what, what a lot of people are curious about. So you are the city lawyer for Rock Springs, Wyoming. Is that correct? I am. I'm the city attorney here, yes. So how do... How, people react when they find out that you're also into ufos well this is my hometown so i've been a weird space guy since i was a little kid and everybody just already knows that all the way up to and including the mayor and, and the mayor that appointed me uh 13 years ago <laughs> wow so uh you know uh, they know that my interest in you, uh, my interest in UFOs is serious, and I really don't get a lot of guff about it. The last two mayors have been rather open to the subject, and most people are. I don't think anyone sees it as something that would inhibit my ability to render good legal advice. I think maybe there might be some people out on the fringe that think that it's an indication of my ability to think critically, but. Uh, I take issue with that, so uh, it doesn't it doesn't interfere with my abilities to render good legal advice and and do good legal work. So I don't really get a lot of guff about it. Surprisingly, I, I mean, I do get a little bit. You know, I, I'm just like everybody else though that's in this. You uh, give somebody gives you a little guff about it, and then two minutes later they'll they're telling you about the sighting they had or the sighting mm -hmm. that their grandparents or their parents or their sister or brother had. So it's not 
as much of a joke as it used to be. And it's not a joke, as you and I both know. So, mm-hmm. Well, that's really of- interesting. Do you think, have there been times, because I, I think I've ran across this, where, you know, in, in my professional life, I, I used to, to shy away from sharing my interests, but then they'd see me on the news or something, and, and they'd, they'd maybe make fun of me a bit or something. But with a lot of people... It kind of brought some credibility because they were like, "Hey, you know, I I know you're you're good at what you do in your professional life, so there must be something to this." Have Have you ran across that also? Yes, I, you know, I have a monthly meeting and and meet with people, and I I do think that, uh, you know, being a lawyer and having the background that I do does. It, sort of lend an air of credibility to the UFO subject. I think, And that's why you bring up an important point, Alejandro. I think it's important for people with higher educations uh, who've been fortunate enough to achieve those to uh, perhaps look into this issue because it is not as cut and dried as, as one would think that it it might be. It's not a uh, – and the people that are involved in it, as you know, are not crazy – and the people who study it are not crazy. As a matter of fact, they're just uh, curious individuals that just never seem to get the answers. It's not uh, it's not an easy thing. But I do think it, that you know having a, a higher degree and, and a science background really does uh, sort of uh, lend an air of credibility to the UFO subject. And I think it's important that that that, that take place. And I think it's it's important for more people with higher degrees and, and education to be interested in it. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you're also the MUFON State Director in Wyoming. How long have you had that position? I've been there almost 14 years. Wow. I actually, was I joined MUFON for the first time back in the 80s when it was still a relatively young organization. As a matter of fact, I think uh, – well, and I, I subscribed to the journal. I didn't become a field investigator until after I graduated from law school and started practicing. Uh, but I, I, I think the first time that I signed up to move on was way back in the 80s. So I, you know, and, and of course, you know, had been studying the subject rather intensely from the time I was uh, just a kid. But uh, I've been involved with move on for many, many years and, and uh, 13 years now as the state director. You know. And what uh, spurned you, I guess, uh, influenced you to get involved with move on? Well, uh, to me, uh, if you're going to study a, a subject, you want to associate with others who also study the subject. And I'm not a what you would call a crystal bearing uh, type. I'm <laughs> not to the into the um, <laughs> I, I guess the sort of paranormal aspects, perhaps, of the UFO phenomenon. I'm interested in more as a scientist from a scientific perspective, not as a scientist and an attorney. And to me, MUFON uh, embodies that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that, you know, of course, the, the credo of MUFON is, a, is an organization devoted to the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And I, I believe in that mission. And I think that uh, MUFON uh, best uh, is best suited to take up that mantle. So, um, that's why I joined MUFON. I just felt it was the most level-headed. I don't see a lot of folks in MUFON, field investigators and so forth, that that reach wild conclusions about, you know, what, UFO, what UFOs are and so forth. I think it's important to um, stay grounded and, uh, you know, keep an open mind, but uh, we have to rely on science. I think uh, our friend Mark would agree with that. We would have to rely mm-hmm. on science to make judgments about the phenomenon. And so as, a, as an organization, you know, our whole purpose is to gather data uh, and we reach conclusions about what that data tells us. And what the conclusions are basically is we can either identify something that flies or we can't. Uh, going on to make some sort of a statement about, you know, that must mean it's an alien spacecraft. Uh, that's just something that we don't do. I, I think it's difficult to prove that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think that um, the fact that you have this five to ten percent of unexplained that uh, that certainly leaves open the possibility that at least some of those unidentified objects are in fact alien probes. I think that's a very real possibility, and, and of course I have my own personal 
feelings and beliefs about that, but I try not to let those personal beliefs or uh, those uh, personal inclinations, I guess, influence what my conclusions are when I do my reports. So, you know. Yeah, you know, a lot of people will may feel, oh, you know, alien probes, that seems sort of fringe, but there are a lot of scientists, actually, who have said, I think... I'm not even sure one major scientist, it might have been Stephen Hawking, I can't remember who it was, said that if there are UFOs and if we're being visited, the first thing that they would send are probes, because that makes the most sense that you would send, sure. you know, a machine um, which can last longer and, and resist more of the, the stress and the, the uh, trauma that would it would take to go through space. So, I mean, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think there's a, an idea out there of something called a von Neumann probe, where you know you you talk about a a, a number of self-replicating robots that essentially oh, yeah. go out into the galaxy or into the universe and and replicate themselves and looking for life. Uh, so uh, you know that's another possibility that they're, they're they may simply be probes because you know you, you and I both know that there have been many 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 cases involving alleged humanoids uh, alleged well not just humanoids but alleged occupants of some of these craft and I think those are important cases to look at too I think that they mm-hmm. they give some clues about the nature of the phenomenon mm-hmm. but I'm I'm with jo- I'm with Jacques Vallée I think that there are many different explanations for the UFO phenomenon. I think that, you know, I don't know if we discussed this when we were at the Devil's Tower event, but my, my feeling has always been that, you know, we're, hum, humanity is more or less like a, a, we're in a little tidal pool on the edge of the ocean. And, and we've reached a lot of really strong conclusions about what the ocean is like and what sort of creatures live there without ever actually having been there. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's very important for us to keep an open mind and keep and with the idea being that when you look out there into that vast ocean, living in a little tidal pool like so many little minnows, that there are big things out there. There are, you know, whales and sharks and, and squid and, you know, so take that and multiply it, you know, infinitely and look out into the universe. And I don't think that we have any sort of a clue about what lies out there except that everything out there is made of the same thing that we're made out of. So Star I suspect, stuff. You're right. <laughs> I, I suspect that, that uh, life is – and this is my uh, personal opinion mm-hmm. – but life – is pervasive throughout the universe that you I bet you couldn't swing a cat without hitting life and I think we already know that I think our scientists know that but I think there's also a, a certain uh, a modicum of um, disinformation and secrecy involved with that which I don't think is necessarily uh, unneeded mm-hmm. it, it may very well be that if we were to be told that we were not alone in the universe that that could really cause some very serious social upheaval now i'm glad you know i'm glad that came up because uh, i do think that there are probably re I'm, I'm one of those guys that that thinks that maybe it's a good idea that we don't tell everybody and i'll, I'll, I'll explain why mm-hmm. from from my perspective um Every human being on the planet was raised uh, believing that we are the only life in the universe, the only intelligent life in the universe. It's only been in recent years that the notion of life out there in the universe has been sort of a, you know, becoming more culturally accepted. It's always been something that we've speculated about, but it's becoming perhaps more of a reality now. But, but essentially, every human being's ego has been constructed around the notion that we are the only ones. And until we hear differently, that's not going to change. So imagine this for a minute, Alejandro, that it's not just a a matter of uh, people uh, learning one day that we're not alone in the universe and not the only intelligent civilizations in the universe. Think about this. Think about what would happen culturally to our planet if simultaneously every person on this planet, suddenly came to the realization that we were not alone in the universe. What would happen 
what that would cause is a complete restructuring of the ego of every human being on the planet simultaneously. And so what are the social ramifications of that? What are the physical ramifications of that? I don't think that there's any way that you can predict it beyond saying that it's very possible that you could see utter chaos, at least for some period of time, until uh, all the people that were going to kill themselves do that. And the only people that remain are those that want to get up and go to work tomorrow. And we just sort of adapt to it as a society. But I think that's what we're talking about. I think that's why they don't tell us, because we're talking about the complete restructuring of every human being being's ego at the same time. So uh, that's a national security concern if I've ever s- seen or heard of one. Mm-hmm. So I, from, from my perspective, it's probably, probably a good reason for the secrecy. And most, I mean, you and I, we're used to the idea. We talk about it. We go to conferences. Right. We, we do these things. And so it's not big news to us, but we're on the fringe. And so that's a real danger. And I, I don't necessarily disagree that we uh, uh, That makes me think of an interesting question because I agree with you. I, um, if I were in a decision-making position, I cannot say if I was handed all of the information out there, I would not agree to some sort of secrecy. I, I, we don't know without all the information, I don't think. But right. let me ask you this. So you're a MUFON state director, and now recently you're also on the board. So the big board that uh, overlooks all of MUFON. What if, as you're read into the MUFON board, they're like, okay, there are some secrets that the government has asked us to keep, and we've decided to keep those secrets. What would you do? <laughs> well... I think that would be up to each individual member of the board because we're not under a national security oath. I'm under, I have taken no oath, right? Uh, you know, uh, to pledge allegiance to MUFON. And so if we were presented with information, uh, you know, the board was presented with information, uh, you know, I guess I would have to decide at that time. I can tell you that that hasn't happened, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but if it did, I, I would have to seriously consider that and consider what we've discussed. And, uh, but again, if it's not within the context of information that I have received, uh, you know, after I've taken a security oath, I would first of all have to question whether or not the information was legally disseminated to the board to begin with, whether or not the individual or individuals who provided us with that information had, in fact, uh, deemed it necessary for the members of the MUFON board to learn about that, uh, you know, I, I would have to kind of look into it, I guess, and I'd have to decide at that time. Mm-hmm. But I would make a decision on my own at that time whether or not I felt that it was some and, – and certainly if, if Jan or the rest of the board uh, determined that it was uh, not a good idea to disseminate the information, then I, I may or may not go along with it. And, and uh, you know, but I'm a team player. Mm-hmm. So – I guess I'd have to see why they – and here's another thing. I can't imagine being told that information and then being told that we can't say anything. If we were, I'd, I'd have to wonder if it was an experiment to see if we could keep our mouths shut. <laughs> yeah, that's a good – well, and you know, those are a lot of good points. And that's why you're probably going to you – know, well, you are a great resource for MUFON because you have that legal background because yep. your immediately knee-jerk reaction is to look at it from a legal standpoint or – a verification of information, and That's which is more of a social kind of thing, uh, which is needed, which is which is important because you bring up a lot of great points there. Right, I, I think it's important to think of all the ramifications, and when you're in a in a position uh, like the MUFON board is, and sometimes we do get interesting information about interesting cases, and and uh, I think it's a position of responsibility. I think the board and each individual members of the board bear a certain responsibility to be as level-headed as possible so we're not out there making, you know, claims that cannot be verified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, I mean, and kind of what I was talking before, um, there are conspiracies around MUFON, and then there are also concerns about, you know, the scope of of what MUFON's been looking at, especially lately. Um, Do you you think, I mean, any of that is caused to, to... leave MUFON or not become a member of MUFON? 
No, I, no, I, I, I know that there, were, you know, there was some controversy about the uh, speakers that we had. I have to say that I really enjoyed the symposium, and I, I don't see anything wrong with uh, um, uh, looking into areas of the phenomenon that uh, are somewhat controversial. I think it's important to look at all the aspects of the phenomenon, and, and you know, we look at UFOs, and uh, you know, we all know there's a secret space program, for example. The question is, to what extent does the secret program exist is it just this sort of space shuttle looking thing that they send up every few months is that the extent of the secret space program or is there more to it uh you know if there could be things taking place within that context that are just exactly the way some of our speakers say that they are it's just that uh, you know when we when we start talking about things like uh, you know time travel and age regression and things like that. When, when we talk about things like that, I think a, a, a you know the level of proof or the level of uh, of evidence uh, has to in, increase. But I don't see anything wrong with talking about it because you know I talk a lot about when I do my talks. As you know, you may have not have been there for my presentation. Oh, I was there We're for seventy five percent of it, and then I got called out. Oh. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you caught some of it. But I, I, I look at consciousness, the nature of the universe, and so forth. But most of that particular presentation is based on speculation. But I, I don't see anything wrong. And I think it's actually important to look at some of these aspects of the phenomenon while still maintaining our ground in science. So I think that what we do with the information, some of the information that we were presented at the MUFON Symposium is to, like a lot of other things that we run into in this field, is to sort of uh, put some of that in the gray basket and leave it for a later time to see what exactly formulates. I'm, I'm not completely closed to the notion of some of the things that were proposed to us at the symposium, and I don't think that it abrogates our devotion to science or the scientific method. It just gives people an opportunity to talk about different aspects of the phenomenon. And I mean, let's face it, if we were to uh, go beyond uh, merely whether we can identify or not identify a certain object and start talking about all these other things that we're talking about, like the social ramifications and what, what happens if we do have a secret space program, because clearly that's UFO related. Well, clearly there, there may be a lot of UFOs that are attributable to technology that we have developed and is related to that. So I think we have to keep an open mind. And that's, you know, and I think that's the name of your website, isn't it? It is, in fact. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, and I agree. I, I, and I don't think it, I don't think we're abrogating uh, our devotion to science or the scientific method because we can't make any more claims today than we could prior to that symposium. Uh, all we can say is that, in my view, that there are objects flying around in our atmosphere that we can ident cannot identify and appear to be operating well outside known flight envelopes. I think that we can say that unequivocally and have the um, support of science and the scientific method to make that statement. Mm -hmm. I think, but when when we start saying things like, um, you know, well this this happened, I just don't have any proof of it. Well, that's that's good, and we can we can take that into consideration, but we don't necessarily have to say, okay. Uh, we've got a secret space program and we're in contact with uh, blue bird beings from another <laughs> galaxy or another existence. I don't think we have to say that. I just I just think we have to say it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, w like your second talk was speculation, but you you um, said this is my speculation. This is how I feel. You you know, you gave a great preamble that you don't have to believe what I believe, but you know, living my life and looking at what I look at, this is what I I think is going on. And no. what's great is then I think it opens up people to listen also. And so many people, you know, afterwards I heard talking about it were like, yeah, you know, I have similar feelings and I'm interested in this or that too, which is completely fair. And then the other thing is with the, the symposium, I, I was a little frustrated by, I guess, the individuals presenting some of the information and their credibility. However, the board and the people who put that on, they're there 
for the same reasons we are. They're just interested sure. in the topic, I think. So, yeah, I, think, a, yeah mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to speak for the board, but I can, I can speak certainly as a member of the board to say that, uh, you know, we were interested in hearing from people that had things like this to say, but we weren't, you know, at least I, for one, wasn't necessarily uh, willing to follow them down the primrose path and, and believe everything that was said. I do right. think there's a lot, of, a lot of credibility to what Bill Thompson said. Uh, I do think that it's very possible that we have large spacecraft out there. As you recall, Gary McKinnon, in his talk, said that when he was looking at the information that he found on the Internet, that he found evidence of a secret space program being run by the Department of, the Department of Naval Intelligence, and that there but, were references to ships and ship crews. I'm not saying that that's true, but I'm he saying... He didn't save any of it, and he was drunk and stoned when he did it, which he admits. So, but right. anyway, we are out of time, so we got to go to break. Uh, we'll talk more about this when we get back, but if you're listening on KGRA, then you'll hear some commercials. P- please pay patronize these these commercials uh they help keep kgra on the air and if you're a podcast listener you'll hear some music for a second so we'll be right back with richard beckwith Right, we are back, and you're listening to Open Minds UFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and our guest is Richard Beckwith, who is the state director uh, for MUFON in Wyoming. Um, I want to talk to you about Wyoming. So you said you've sure. been out there doing this for 14 years, and uh, of course— Longer than that, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so I, ma- my, many, many well, years. I, yeah, I have. Uh, since the late 70s, my— uh, Wow. You know, that's where it started for me was, uh, well, I, I think we might have talked about it when we were at the Red uh, or the Devil's Tower event. But, um, it, my interest in UFO started when I was uh, just a kid, and my dad is a joker, and he told me that there was the, this crash of a, a flying saucer in New Mexico, that they re- the government recovered bodies, and the, and the military covered it up. And, and uh, he told me that when I was a kid, I was probably nine, eight, nine, ten years old. And I remember just being fascinated. But part of me, just like everybody else is thinking, you know, my dad's full of it. So <laughs> I did what a lot of kids did back when, uh, you know, when we had, you know, curiosity and things like that. I went to the library and I read every book I could find on the UFO subject. And gee whiz, my dad was right. Well, at least about the allegation that that had taken place. And I've just mm-hmm. been hooked since. So uh, I got involved with, um, uh, I started doing radio when I was 16 years old. I got a job at the local radio station. And then when I was 18, the news director quit. And so they made me the news director of the local radio station when I was 18 years <laughs> old. Cool. Yeah. And so the first thing I wanted to do was a week-long special on UFOs. And this is in 1978. So it would have been uh, about the year I graduated from high school. So the year years. Close Encounters came out. Right. And so that there was also or there were also a lot of things happening in Wyoming at that time as you recall Dr. Leo Sprinkle was very active at the counseling center and had not yet started doing his yearly um, contact e conferences but he was working with a guy named Pat McGuire who, uh, as you may or may not recall, was he was actually rather well known way back then uh, for being a, a an abductee, an alleged abductee, and so that's where I started was with going down and getting myself, you know, acquainted with Doctor Sprinkle and also with Pat McGuire, and, and interestingly. Uh, I got to spend some time with Pat. I was actually, uh, this is really interesting, we uh, got to sit in on on a regressive hypnosis session with Pat McGuire, Dr. Sprinkle, and there was a psychic there at that time named um, Elaine Fortson. She was also rather well known back in the late 70s. And so we watched this regressive hypnosis session and then spent the weekend at Pat McGuire's ranch, where he had alleged that he had 
daily visits by UFOs and also had a story about the fact that he had built a well on his property in a location where all the geologists and hydrologists had told him he was wasting his time because it was a big solid rock and he did it anyway because he alleged that the visitors had told him to do so and when he built this well, drilled this well, he ended up drilling into a offshoot of the Ogallala Aquifer and so this well pumps hundreds of thousands of gallons of water every day. It's uh, and still uh, works to this day. Pat McGuire has since passed away, but that's where I started was with that week long special on UFOs. And so, uh, and I started looking into the subject obviously when I was very young and devoting some serious time to it, and really felt, uh, you know at that time that I really needed some more education. And so I, I had been a musician for a while and went back to school and uh, got a degree in molecular biology and then uh, my law degree. And I worked in labs while I was going to school and while I was going to law school. I worked um, doing cancer research for the VA in Boise uh, and worked in several labs, molecular virology lab, a molecular genetics lab, and um, um, uh, atmospheric bacteriology lab and so I spent a lot of time doing lab work and and then when I got out of school of course my interest in UFOs never waned and the whole time I'm reading and then when I started practicing law it was probably about 10 years after I started practicing that I you know got back into MUFON and became a field investigator and it's actually just not too long after that I started giving some informal legal advice to the uh, board at that time. Uh, usually, I think it started with uh, John Schusler and then uh, James Carrion and then uh, Dave McDonald and uh, Clifford Cliff. And now that Jan has become the um, uh, international or executive director, I guess, I've, you know, just for, sort of provided, uh, you know, informal legal advice to the board and to the various directors for many years and and uh, of course have been very active in, in the investigation of UFOs and I and boy I, you know that led to my working for um, uh, Dr. Greer I worked for Dr. Stephen Greer for about three years on his Orion project and I was involved with the um, uh, attempt to obtain the Stan Meyer technology mm -hmm. uh, had written up contracts and so forth and uh, yeah I, and, I, I, I want to touch on this real quick because um, I feel and I've, I've had issues with uh, interviewing him and not being completely uh, honest with certain things and so I've always wondered about the Stan Meyer technology and uh, I had talked to you about it and yeah. uh, I do trust you and yeah. and so you said that uh, you know, this really was some sort of technology um, yeah. that seemed uh, that was, to actually uh, work. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, that was that was based on what we got back from the engineers. We had uh, I can't remember. I, I can't. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. You know, uh, the only reason I'm able to talk about this publicly is because it it was you know made public in the uh, movie uh, Serious, and so uh, I watched that and I and uh, and I thought, wow, I was involved in that, <laughs> and I was, and it really did happen. Uh, we did have some engineers look at the technology, and we were basically told that there were things there that we might be able to use. And so a bid was made. I don't believe that I can talk about the details of how much and what the contracts precisely said. And so uh, forth. Just real quick, so people know, and this was an over-unity device. So in other words, it was creating electricity out of, out of uh, more than was put in it. So free energy device kind of thing. Well, uh, possibly. What? Well, yeah, we, we, I think we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, with Stan Meyer, it was water related, and he had some sort of a process. And I, I don't know if it was a, you know, a, and I, I don't know the details of the processes, and I don't know the details of what the engineers looked at or what they, what they said, other than yeah, it looks like we have something here. But it was related to uh, water, as you may recall. Stan Meyer mm. was the guy that was running his dune, but that dune buggy on a, on a tank of water, he just put oh, water. Oh yeah, in way, and that was the guy. And so this wasn't necessarily something like a like a field generating device. Or, or, or a field, uh, you know, that would, you know, something that would mm -hmm. uh, tap into a field. I do believe that that Dr. Greer had contact with individuals, and I, I do believe that we had uh, people at high places in the government that uh, had some knowledge about these 
sorts of technologies. But the Stan Meyer thing really did happen. We had somebody there ready, waiting uh, to take the stuff out of the garage. As you know, Stan had passed away and it belonged to his estate. Uh, but somebody came in and, and uh, outbid us, and then they wouldn't talk to us anymore. So uh, what happened in the film, the way they talked about it in the film, that, that really did happen. And, and I know because I was involved in it. So mm-hmm. there was a technology there. Uh, at least that's what that's what we were told by the engineers who reviewed the technologies. Yeah, that is fascinating. So, I mean, yeah. he was able to run this engine off of water. Now I remember, and he had his dune buggy and yeah. uh, a, a technology. I don't, I, don't was, I don't know if it was some sort of... Uh, more efficient hydrolysis process because mm-hmm. you, you, know, you can you can make brown gas browns gas by hydrolyzing water and and so but I I, it, I don't know that that was necessarily it it was something more than that something that, mm. uh, that and but I, I w- and I wish I could tell you that because well if I knew I'd be making the stuff myself and I wouldn't yeah. be <laughs> so but it really was yeah some uh, and and. What's even more curious is that, you know, that was several years ago, right? And, yeah. and we still haven't seen that technology come out. I don't think you ever will. Yeah, it uh, seems I like it was suppressed. What a lot of people don't understand or realize is that there's something out there called the Patent Secrecy Act. And, and under the Patent Secrecy Act, a, a energy production device can only be so efficient before it becomes a matter of national security and cannot be patented. I don't think most people realize that. So, you know, the the fact is that there are all kinds of devices out there that have been patented that work that uh, we will never see. Uh, Well, at least until the Patent Secrecy Act is amended so that these technologies can make their way out of the secret compartments they've been placed into, but uh, the the law of our country does not allow us to see these devices because they're a threat to national security. And if you don't believe me, look it up. It's mm-hmm. the, it's it's true. That's pretty fascinating. That's incredible. Now yeah. with uh, Wyoming. Um, I would like you to talk about maybe like a, a sighting case, perhaps oh, yeah. even your own or a, an extraordinary sighting case that uh, comes to mind. Well, I, I, you know, there there are a, a couple of cases that, that come to mind. You know, I, I have to say that, that myself, I can't honestly say that I've ever seen a UFO. Uh, but that but like many researchers, I don't need to see one to mm-hmm. know the phenomenon is real. Okay, uh, but I have had some pretty good cases in in Wyoming. Uh, one one case in particular uh, kind of sticks out of my mind. Well, there's a few cases I think. You know, I, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, ex- with my cases, uh, some of them I can explain, and some of them I can't. And most of the cases I get are very easily explained. I not uh, I'm mostly what I get is anomalous nocturnal light seen by one or two observers in the same location. Uh, but this case in particular really sticks out of my mind. This was a law enforcement officer in Casper who shall remain nameless uh, by his own request, uh, and I'm going to honor that. But uh, he was sleeping, he and his wife, one night. About 2 o'clock in the morning, his dog starts bugging him to go outside, and this is in uh, November, so it's about another couple months from now, that time of year, and it wasn't super cold out. There wasn't snow on the ground, so he takes his dog out, and uh, he stands at the back door and lets his dog out into the yard to do his business. And it, it's not a really big dog, just kind of one of those little dogs, whom I met, by the way. <laughs> Real nice. Dog. And uh, he said that while he was standing there, all of a sudden he noticed that there was something above the house across the alley or across from his backyard. And so he looked up and he saw um, a beveled box is what, how he described it. It was about 60 feet long and about 40 feet wide. And this beveled box had windows going down uh, all around on, on the side. And he said that he was just blown away because this thing was just floating there and it wasn't making any sound, but it was just floating over the neighbor's house. And so he, you know, just stood there uh, flabbergasted and he watched this thing. And as it floated over his house, started to float past him over kind of over his yard he noticed that there were uh three people standing in it and one of them appeared to be wearing like a cap you know like a baseball cap kind of thing but the, again this thing was making absolutely no sound hmm. so as this thing floated past him and it's only he said it was maybe 
100 feet above him. So this is a very close encounter. And so he watched, and this is this thing is black uh, and sort of dull and, uh, you know, no seams or rivets that he could recall. But as this thing floated past, uh, he said that there was a moment when one of the individuals who was standing in the windows looked at him and he looked at the individual and they sort of had a moment where, and he said that this individual raised up his hand and waved at him <laughs> wow. as the thing floated by. And so uh, being a police officer or being a law enforcement officer, he his immediately immediate instinct is, I have to get some sort of evidence of this. So as this thing started to float over his house and, you know, now he would have to see it by going to the front, he ran into his house really quickly and grabbed a camera. And then when he got back out, it was gone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Always what the case. Was, yeah, yeah. You know, and so when I, of course, I, I was not able to tell what, what sort of object that was and no one else had seen it. Uh, but uh, according to him, the, all the animals in the neighborhood were barking and so forth. And so my conclusion about that case was that I couldn't identify it. It was an unidentified object. But if I were to speculate, which I'm going to do now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that it, it may very well have been some kind of a stealth aircraft, an experimental stealth aircraft. Mm. Because, uh, and what sort of gave a clue to well, I think a clue to it, is the fact that it was completely had completely flat surfaces on it. It was a beveled box. So it wasn't a square shoe box. So it was like a shoe box, but with the the corners were beveled. And so um, that uh, what it indicated to me was that it might very well have been that uh, not only that it was um, you know undetectable by radar, but that it may have had something in the fabric of the craft itself that allowed it to disguise itself. Uh, but you know. So it's a possibility that it could have been a military craft, but I, but I still have a problem with that too because this thing is a hundred feet uh, floating over somebody's house in Casper, Wyoming. Now we do have an Air Force base in Cheyenne, F.E. Warren Air Force Base, and we have uh, an Air Force base in Montana, a couple of them, and we've got an Air Force base in Utah and in Colorado. So there's all kinds of Air Force bases, you know, military bases around us from whence or from where this thing could have come, but definitely one of the most interesting cases that I've had. So, yeah. yeah. That yeah. is a really good one. Um, and like you said, which is a good point, that it could have been some sort of technology, but I wonder, um, now that you've you know been in this for so long, um, do you feel there is an extraterrestrial presence that, you know, there are somebody from elsewhere coming to check us out? Yes, mm -hmm. and 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 I, what I would say is, why wouldn't it? You know, when I hear when I hear people say, well, and especially so-called skeptics or well, not skeptics, debunkers, because I'm a skeptic myself, and, and and you and I know that there's a big difference between being a skeptic and being a debunker. Right. Skeptic, it just means that you want to see all the evidence, that you want to, you know, that you're you're skeptical until you know all of the facts. So. Uh, yes, I do. I, I think that I, I'm, I'm with Stanton Friedman. I think that there is an extraterrestrial presence, and, and, and I see absolutely no reason in science to say that there wouldn't be. To say that the stars are too far away to me is a ridiculous argument. It's just like saying, you know, like saying that, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, well, the Earth is flat. Well, how do you know that? Well, you know, by through experimentation and so forth, all of a sudden, you know, we learn that, wow, hundreds of years ago, we learned that the Earth is round. So I think we just have to keep our mind open to the facts. And, 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 and I think, um, with Michio Keku, that we need to stop thinking of these other civilizations as being only five or 10,000 or a few hundred years ahead of us technologically and start thinking of them, of them as being thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years ahead of us technologically. And when we look at civilizations like that, especially when you and I both know that right now there is a, a, a project to develop a real live warp drive. And so if we're looking at technology that we can do now or that we that is possible now or, we're, you know, think about these other civilizations, it, it at least leaves open the possibility that others have figured this out already. And, and for some of these sightings, it's kind of hard to 
you know, look at an explanation that beyond you can't identify it. When you start looking for the actual actual explanation, it's kind of hard to look at something other than an extraterrestrial hypothesis, which, as you and I again both know, is a conclusion that was reached by the Comita panel in France. And so we're really the only country that doesn't take that possibility seriously. So I, I don't think that it's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, but I would say as, a, as an attorney that if I were to take that case, uh, I think that I could prove the extraterrestrial hypothesis by a preponderance of the evidence in mm-hmm. front of a jury. And, and I, I, would, I wouldn't mind having that opportunity someday and working with others uh, in a, perhaps a, you know, a courtroom-style debate, uh, much like the uh, uh, faux hearings we had in Washington over that. Mm-hmm. You know? But, uh, yeah, I do, Alejandro. I do think that, that an explanation for some UFOs is that they are, in fact, alien probes, and some of them are, in fact, piloted. And I think we are being visited. I think we've been the subject of the interest of other civilizations for some time. And again, I ask, why wouldn't we be? And why wouldn't it be a possibility? And and don't tell me that it's because the stars are too far away, because they're not. And we're going to be there someday ourselves, probably before we know it. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Yep. I think it was, uh, I don't remember who it was. It, uh, maybe it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, any sufficiently advanced technology will look like magic. So... Right. Uh, put that together with Kaku's ideas, which are correct that they could be hundreds of thousands of mil- or millions of years ahead of us. It right. makes it all very, very possible. And, so, and what would an alien probe look like? Yeah. You know, I mean, when we, we do know a couple right. of things. We know that, a, that an alien probe uh, will probably act a little bit differently and behave in different ways than what we're used to. Mm-hmm. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much. This has been a terribly interesting conversation. I guess to find out more about Wyoming MUFON, they can go to MUFON.com? That's right. They certainly can, MUFON.com. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, if you have a sighting in Wyoming, please report it. I also have my own website, RichardBeckwith.com. And uh, I never did tell you that I was writing a book, but you can get that one, too. It's called The Corporate. It's a, it's a, a fiction, uh, science fiction novel. So. Oh, cool. Oh. The Corporate, and that's out? Or- yeah, yeah, I published it two years ago. And that's at richardbeckwith.com then. That's correct. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's good talking to you again, Alejandro. I hope we get a chance to talk again soon. Me too. Thank you so much to Richard Beckwith for being on the show. What an interesting fella. That was a lot of fun. So he is the state director for MUFON in Wyoming. If you need some more information about how to contact him or report a UFO in Wyoming, you could go to MUFON.com. Or like he said, to hear about his book or other things he's up to, you can go to Richard Beckwith beckwith.com so thanks again richard hopefully we'll have him back on the show at some point or another otherwise we do have some really cool shows slated for the future so uh, we're gonna have some cool stuff coming up the news that martin and i talked about is at openminds.tv and we do have even more about the alien autopsy so philip mantle had written an article where he went over some of what martin was talking about at the beginning of the show and all of his interviews with all of the people involved so you can go step by step and see how all of this happened and unfortunately this gentleman santilli who seems to keep fooling people uh the things things do not line up the timeline and and what everyone's saying uh, to his version of the story. Uh, there's a little battling of back and forth. And of course, there's drama and intrigue and money. Money is, seems to always be in the way. So you could check that out uh, at openminds.tv. Also, the Congress. We have had, and I'm not even kidding, a record number of registrations for this year. Uh, I think partially because we've got some really cool speakers, but uh, otherwise, we have. Groups like KGRA advertising for us and partnering with us. So we've got a lot of cool stuff slated for the conference this year. Go to ufocongress.com and you'll be able to see that. Also, if you go to ufocongress.com, you're going to see some links for our on-demand videos. I am posting more and more videos all the time, and we have a free trial so you can watch them for free. So for instance, this week we posted Timothy Good and... Um, Erling Strand. So Erling Strand is a professor out in Norway who actually has a class that investigates UFOs, a UFO phenomena that happens out there in Hesdalen. And uh, they 
really don't know what's going on. And I think you'll be surprised by what Erling Strand says in his evaluation. He also is is pretty mystified. So a lot of people kind of think maybe it's some sort of natural plasma or something like that. He's not so sure about that. And I think what he says uh, he, he thinks is going on will shock the viewers. So you could go check that out. Go to ufocongress.com and you'll see the video on demand there to check that out. And of course, you'll also see our store there. We've got more books and t-shirts and stuff like that going up at the store all of the time. So in fact, we have uh, some good deals on some of the books that uh, you you won't be able to find elsewhere. Otherwise, I want to thank, of course, Martin Willis with Podcast UFO. I want to thank the opening close musician who who gave that to us, Caleb Hanks. Really cool stuff. You can find out more about him at openminds.tv as well on the radio page. I also want to thank Systematics, who created that cool bumper music that we go in and out of commercials on. And I want to thank KGRA for having us on their station. Otherwise, I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you so, so much for joining us every week. And uh, we're going to do what we can to make sure that we've got some really cool shows coming up for the next few weeks for you as well. So thank you so much for listening. Until next time, adios muchachos.